I'm Catherine Pompilio with an episode of Chatter for May 30th, 2022. For today's episode, the team at Lawfare decided to cross-post this week's episode of Chatter, a podcast hosted by David Priest and Shane Harris that features in-depth discussions with fascinating people at the creative edges of national security. Today's Chatter episode is entitled The Movie Casablanca in Myth and Reality with Meredith Hindley. In the episode, Priest sits down with Hindley to discuss the movie, the city's wartime history, and the veracity of Casablanca's representations about Casablanca. Their conversation covers her advocacy for the humanities and history, unexpected discoveries in archival research, and appreciation of the film, American and French resistance intelligence operations in French Morocco, intersections between wartime Casablanca and personalities from Franklin Roosevelt to Josephine Baker, what the film got right and wrong about the experiences of refugees, and more. This is Chatter. This is Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, author Meredith Hindley on the movie Casablanca in myth and reality. Jack Warner had a problem with the movie Casablanca because even though it had a great cast, he still had to figure out how to market the movie and nobody knew where Casablanca was. And Operation Torch and Allied Invasion solved that problem for him. What good would a letter signed by Charles de Gaulle have given you in Casablanca before the war? It would be good for getting arrested. (laughs) The movie has had a very long afterlife because of issues that it brings up, the choices that the characters make, and that notion of, you know, what, what side are you on? Meredith. Thank you for coming on Chatter with me. Thank you for having me. Pleased to be here. You have long been involved with researching and writing about the humanities and history. What what first pushed you in that direction? I think from a young age, I was always that person who wanted to know why something happened or how something happened. And sort of making history my career just seemed like a natural fit for that because there are so many questions that you can ask about the past that also then help you understand the present. That's so interesting because the the why, the way that you answered that originally was understanding the why behind things. And I don't know, it seems like we undervalue that as a society now, that we're we're less interested in that deep understanding and more interested in a like a superficial mm-hmm. answer that we can give. And that's a shame because the humanities and, and history give us that depth that's much more useful for for going forward but let me let me ask you you're you're the advocate for this why why are the humanities and history these undervalued areas so important and if you could disaggregate them a bit the humanities versus history and how do they complement each other and how do they work separately in that goal so the humanities are essentially the study of the human condition and history is part of that as is or I should say are, uh, literature, uh, philosophy, and uh, art history, anything that provides context or criticism about a particular topic. And I think any time that we can provide context, that's a good thing. Uh, because the way in which we see the world is shaped by our framework for it. And the humanities are essentially about context. They provide answers for why things happen. Why is that street named that? Why do we celebrate that holiday? Why uh, why are we involved in that war? Why are we interested in receiving these refugees, but not those refugees? Why did a nation pay reparations or not pay reparations? Um, questions that are still sort of um, are about that are sort of key to issues that are today can find context and in the humanities. On the history side, your research and writing on history has spanned from the ancient to the modern. What what are your favorite periods of history and why? I ended up uh, doing World War II, um, and I kind of got there through, uh, via, believe it or not, the Civil War. Um, that was sort of my first love, huh. because 
Um, so as an 80s kid, this is the era of the big sprawling historical novels, the big sprawling miniseries, uh, of which the big one was North and South. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to be honest and say that like this, I'm, I'm a historian for whom popular culture fueled my interest in history. So there was an adaptation of James Jake's North and South. It was this massive sort of event when we used to, when we had uh, TV events on network TV. Um, and that was my first sort of my first really interest in war and what war could do a, to a society and how people chose what side of an issue they were on. Mm-hmm. And then as I, then when I went to college, I became more and more interested in European history and my interest in World War II uh, really developed, um, not the least of which was uh, fueled by having grown up watching World War II movies with my dad, mm-hmm. uh, but really the issues of how does one defeat fascism? How do we prevent the Holocaust from happening again? Why mm-hmm. did Nazi Germany come to power? How can we prevent something like that from happening again? And those were questions that were that became very important to me and in terms of digging into them and exploring them and helping to understand how that particular regime could exert so much terror and destruction across the European continent and so much death. And inspire so many people in different fields, because as you mentioned, it kind of got you this interest in history to to answer some of these questions and the human side of things. But there are prominent psychologists who got into the study of psychology because of trying to understand Hitler primarily, but, but others, um, there are political scientists, some very famous ones who got into my field, international relations because of the, the feeling of how did, how did this great war happen? Uh, how did both great wars happen and how do we prevent them from happening again? And then of course, sociologists and others investigating things like the Holocaust and what happens to a culture and a society that can lead down that road. It's just amazing how many fields um, had people inspired by these horrific events of mid-century. In your case, you took it to eventually to Morocco as a topic of independent research. And you have a great teaser line in the acknowledgments of your book, Destination Casablanca, uh, Exile, Espionage, and the battle for North Africa in World War II, which came out some years ago now. But you have a great teaser line in the acknowledgments about stumbling decades ago upon <laughs> mentions of visa troubles and internment camps in French Morocco while you were working on an right. entirely different project. I'd love to hear the story behind that. Uh, so I was writing my dissertation in hist- uh, for a PhD in history on relief to Nazi occupied territories during the war. And the key there is during. So it's during the actual war itself, efforts by the Allies to provide humanitarian aid. And in the State Department files, relief and refugees all go in the same file. So if you're looking in that record group, you are going for stuff about relief, you are also going to find stuff about refugees. And also refugees and relief are also um, connected together as well in terms of how policy was made. So I, here I am, uh, I'm at the National Archives, up at Archives 2, I'm uh, spinning the microfilm, and oh, microfilm, so bad on your eyes, but spinning microfilm, and um, and as I'm looking for these telegrams about relief programs, uh, the role of the American Red Cross, and um, food parcels, there are also telegrams about what's going on in French Morocco and about refugees and the need for visas and uh, the rise of an internment camp. And when you're doing a large research project like a dissertation, you have to have tunnel vision. You cannot get distracted by that shiny thing. But that for me was like, it was one of those, it was like that, sh- that, that shiny thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, French Morocco, Casablanca, wait a minute. <laughs> Because I also ha- happen to be a classic movie fan um, mm-hmm. and like Legions really, you know, love Casablanca, would always watch it when it was on. And so, of course, my brain was instantly, huh, wonder if the movie 
is actually like the history. Mm-hmm. And so that idea really stuck with me, even as I was working on trying to finish my dissertation, writing other things, that idea just kind of stuck. And every time I would watch it on Turner Classic Movies, my brain would fire up and it would be like, remember those documents? Mm -hmm. Remember those documents that you saw? What if you went back and got those documents? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I decided to do that. And that's what this book is, is sort of digging into what is going on in French Morocco during the war. Uh, So it's both about the refugees themselves and the refugee situation, but also about why the allies ultimately end up coming to Casablanca. Right. Uh, Because Casablanca is a, is a major target for operation torch. Sure. And so French Morocco has this sort of great history during the war that isn't written about often Mm -hmm. because most of the action, North Africa is always kind of a sideshow and most of World War II scholarship tends to focus on the continent for a very good reason. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in French North Africa during the war. And uh, so Destination Casablanca is my attempt to dig into it. Right. Let's talk about the other thing you mentioned, this uh, this film that some people may have heard of called <laughs> Casablanca. It's a, it's a new film. If you haven't checked it out, all of you should, should look into it. Um, <laughs> let's not yet talk about it in terms of what you mentioned, your your research into the truth versus fiction of it as much. But let's just talk about it as a pure movie, because you mentioned that mm-hmm. even even as a child, it struck you, right? You'd see it and, and right. something about it captured you. And I'm, I'll admit, I have not watched the dozens or hundreds of war movies that were made that were not necessarily the same but had some similar aspects to Casablanca during a three or four year period when Hollywood mm-hmm. went nuts on the genre. But but Casablanca also stood out to me when I watched it when I was young um, without knowing anything about film theory or the aspects of cinematography. There were aspects of it that somehow I noticed and have only come to appreciate over time. So first of all, the the movie itself was was filmed, and we're recording this around the 80th anniversary of the start of, of principal photography on the movie. The, the 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 movie started without any knowledge that there was going to be keen American interest in Casablanca because of Operation Torch and the effort against the Nazis. Is that right? That's right. They uh, thought they had kind of a uh, interesting story in an exotic location. They, uh, Warner Brothers bought the rights to a play called Everybody Comes to Rick's, and then they gave it a glow up uh, with the help of the uh, Epstein brothers, uh, who are responsible for all those pithy lines that everyone likes to quote. Uh, but they had a, I mean, they thought they had like a, a good film uh, mm-hmm. with some really great actors in it, but they didn't think they had anything particularly special. Hmm. Well, they were wrong about that. Definitely. Obviously, they did have something special. And one thing in rewatching it over the years that has struck me, um, you know, initially, I think it's easy to focus on on Rick, the character Humphrey Bogart. And, you know, does he represent a, a pure human story? Is he representative of America and its isolationism? Is he representative of the world's naivete in some, not naivete necessarily, but the world's callousness? um, towards darkening days. But I think beyond the, the main characters, there are some really interesting stories with the, the actors and the, the music and other elements of the movie that get to me. One thing I didn't know until reading your book was that so many of the actors in this movie, which is about refugees moving through French Morocco, trying to escape Nazi terror, trying to get to often the Western hemisphere um, so many of the actors were themselves refugees from from Germany or from occupied territory, and that makes their their performances more compelling to watch because you realize in some cases they're they're dealing with the emotion of their own experience in a role that most method actors can't can't seek to even in their even in their most serious days. So, how did you feel watching it as you learned more about? 
Casablanca realizing that there were some real life stories here that that lent something special to the acting. As I learned about the story, the, the actual actors themselves and their refugee backgrounds, it made me understand why there is such an emotional core to that movie, mm-hmm. particularly around that scene where Laszlo stands up and sings the Marseillaise. Mm-hmm. And what that represented to them, it's, it's, you know, this idea, it's basically standing up against fascism. It's a small, it's a small act in a bar, but for the people singing it, it also represented, you know, something larger to them that they had fled France or they had fled a fascist regime and that there is, uh, that even small acts can have significant meaning. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to learn that you know, not only people like Paul Heinreid, is that his name? Heinreid. Heinreid, who played, um, who played Laszlo, but even uh, Conrad Veidt, who, who played Heinrich Strasser, the, 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 German, yeah. uh, the German antagonist in the movie. He had been a, a German silent film star, but he himself had escaped with his Jewish wife to the United Kingdom when Hitler came to power. So even even the Nazi right. in the movie was fleeing Nazis. And Madeleine LeBeau, who is, um, he, she plays Yvonne, and Yvonne is, during the Marseillaise uh, part of the film, she's, you know, she's, she's crying, yeah. and it's that sort of beautiful, luminous, it's a luminous shot of her, um, but she's crying. And she herself had, was a French refugee. Uh, she'd left Nazi occupied Europe with her husband, uh, Marcel uh, Diallo, who also is in Casablanca. Mm. And, um, and so they had uh, basically managed to come in through Mexico and up to California. Uh, so she herself had, had a refugee story. Mm-hmm. You know, I haven't been to film school or taken any classes in film. Mm-hmm. So what I'm about to say will either be exceptionally wrong in which case I, I apologize, or so exceptionally basic that it's covered literally in the first five minutes of film school. And, and so I'm not trying to sound profound. It's just something I've noticed is in this movie, the use of light. You mentioned the illumination of Yvonne. Um, mm-hmm. Even an amateur like me notices the use of light in a movie like this. So early on, Rick, you know, the, the cafe owner, the, the callous mm-hmm. American who doesn't care about the war effort and has no scruples, it he's often in shadow or he's often half illuminated as if illustrating the the light and the dark yeah. of his soul at least that's how i see it maybe i've watched too much star wars but then <laughs> as laszlo comes in i i don't remember seeing a shot of laszlo that didn't have him illuminated almost angelic almost almost like some kind of of hero um it's not subtle if i notice it but it seems to me that that carries a message throughout the film as it develops about the the story of Rick and his pull between his, if you will, his dark side or his callous side and his side that looks to, to Laszlo and what he represents here as a fight against authoritarianism. Uh, I would say that those uh, lighting decisions are intentional yeah. uh, and they are also incredibly important. Uh, for the very reasons that you describe, which is the way in which they frame the characters. Mm -hmm. And it also attests to the fact that Casablanca is essentially a movie about choices. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you, what side are you choosing to be on? Uh, Are you going to be, uh, become, you know, what side are you going to be on uh, the light or the dark? Mm -hmm. Uh, Are you going to be, you know, kind of a, a prisoner of your own decision? Are you going to escape? Are you going to, um, are you going to essentially join the right cause? But you're absolutely right. Um, both Rick and Ilsa are always flooded with light in the scenes. They're mm-hmm. also always, almost always wearing white or some version of white. Right. right. Uh, so to be seen as sort of to represent, you know, black, white, good, evil. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, Interesting to me that so many of the lines in the movie, especially early on, are meant to establish Rick, uh, and he's doing some of it himself, to establish himself as this callous, neutral person. And I'm, I'm still not sure whether he was 
putting on airs from the beginning, that he was projecting that to people so they wouldn't question when he ultimately made a righteous choice or not. But Renault, the French captain, is the one who's often calling this out, saying, Rick is completely neutral about everything. Um, or when Rick says to him, I stick my neck out for nobody. And Renault comments, that's a wise policy. <laughs> um, it reminds me of the line from one of my favorite bands, Rush, when they, ha they have a line, uh, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And that's, that's Rick to me, is he's choosing not to decide. It's not that he's choosing evil through most of the movie. He's, he's choosing not to care. He's choosing not to pick a side. But by doing so, you're picking a side. And I think that's the overall message of the movie in its geopolitical context, is you, you can't not take a side when it comes to a conflict like this. And yet Rick either tried or made people think um, that he was trying not to decide the whole way through. And of course, for Ren Renault, this is great because that's Renault's character, right? He's he's saying, I, I, and he's very blatant about it, saying, I have no conviction. I blow with the wind. He's willing to go with Vichy or he's willing to go with the free French, depending on who he thinks right. is winning at the time. And that makes it a really interesting introduction for many people to an aspect of World War II that is sadly little understood in the United States, which is wait a minute, you had France taken over by the Germans, so they occupied it. Yep. But they didn't occupy all of it, so there still was a French state, but it was heavily influenced by the desire not to become occupied. So the, the leader was quite collaborationist, and it led to a lot of disagreement. Most people don't under, and I'm not sure I fully understand the nuances of French politics during the war, because it gets awfully complicated with competing loyalties and personal rivalries. Uh, Vichy politics are incredibly uh, complicated, lots of backstabbing, and um, motivated by the desire to hold power, but also to prevent the Germans from occupying the rest of France. So after the armistice uh, between France and Germany, Germany occupies the northern, basically one third of France, which includes Paris, and allow the creation of unoccupied France or Vichy France. Uh, in the South. And so uh, Henri Philippe Pétain becomes the head of state of Vichy. And he's an aging uh, war hero, much revered in France for his uh, victories during World War I. Um, but he's also increasingly senile, which allows him to be manipulated. But if you take as a precept that a main motivator of Vichy is not is to prevent the Germans from occupying the rest of France, then you begin to see sort of all the accommodations that they start to make. But I also think it's important to remember that many of the men who were in power in Vichy were also sympathetic to a lot of the policies of Nazi Germany. Uh, they implemented anti-Semitic policies without being asked. They were happy to um, in, instill a kind of a version of uh, fascism in France as well. So they had their own sympathies and they were using sort of the war for their own ends. And that that is all backstory to the movie Casablanca. I mean, it doesn't really come right. out. There are some parts of the movie, for example, where you see a, a character shot and die underneath a portrait of mm -hmm. Pétain, right? Right before it goes right. to, you know, a uh, French, you know, fraternity and egalitarian. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a funny contrast there. But otherwise, the, the conflicts between and among the French themselves are almost never addressed. And in fact, one of the oddities in the movie that I'll, I'll talk to you about later has to do with the de Gaulle angle. But yeah. the character of Renault himself appears to be a stand-in for, in a sense, the French soul is, you know, do you, do you collaborate because uh, you, you want to prevent something worse or, or do you stand up for what you feel is right? Uh, because ultimately we understand that, you know, he, he thinks he knows what the right, what the right cause is. So to me, it's, it's an, again, a gateway into learning more about the French experience in World War II, even though the movie really doesn't delve into that part of it too much. It doesn't, but the the, the aspect of collaborationism yeah. does 
inform it uh, mm-hmm. because that becomes a key issue for the French, who is a collaborator, uh, who isn't a collaborator. And in French Morocco in particular, uh, continues as a... So after when the French and the Germans signed the armistice, uh, the condition is that Vichy France maintains control of the colonies in French North Africa. Mm-hmm. So French Morocco is still under control of Vichy, which means that if you work for the French Morocco, for the protectorate of French Morocco, you are working for Vichy. Mm-hmm. There is no way to get around that. Right. So you are supporting this government that is beholden to Nazi Germany. Right. And do I remember the history right that uh, Charles de Gaulle tried to, was it Dakar in what is now Senegal? It was Dakar. He, he actually tried yeah. to wrest it away from Vichy control and make it a, a headquarters for the free French and, and he failed. Yes. Yeah. He failed. Yeah. And in fact, that uh, makes him very suspicious to uh, French officers and the French resistance in sure. North Africa for that very reason. Sure. Well, let's talk about the, the the core issue at the heart of the movie, and that really gets to the core issue of some of your research uh, about Casablanca itself, which is the refugees. Um, you had uh, probably uncountable refugees fleeing not only Nazi Germany itself, but the the territories mm-hmm. that had been occupied across Europe, and some of them tried directly to get to places uh, like the United Kingdom. But it seems like many more went south, and they went south often through France, especially when France was falling in the middle of 1940, made their way to the Mediterranean to get to Africa. And the thought was Africa, not under German control directly, um, Africa could be a staging point to get to the Americas, um, often through Lisbon, neutral Portugal being a transit Mm -hmm. point in many ways. Right. But you had to get the visa. You had to get permission to go before they would let you leave Casablanca in the case that you've studied, but a lot of North Africa. Right. So talk about that refugee situation. How how did Casablanca change from the way it was before the Second World War to the way it was in late 1940, 1941, as the, the story of the movie Casablanca right. picks up on in terms right. of the amazing diversity of refugees coming into the city. So Casablanca ends up as a key point on sort of the refugee trail, as they call it, because it is the largest port in Africa on the Atlantic. And if you are a refugee, you essentially want to get to the closest point you can until you get to the Atlantic. So you want a place that you can try and launch yourself, whether it's to Canada or the United States or Mexico or the Caribbean. And Casablanca offered a way to do that because once the, when Germany invaded France, there were 3 million refugees that went to the South and Marseille uh, became an an exit point. And if you're leaving Marseille, you are going to, you're going to essentially go South across the Mediterranean to Algeria, to Algiers, to Iran, or you're going to continue on that journey or you're going to catch a boat and go through Gibraltar around and go to Casablanca. Mm -hmm. And so if you are trying to get to North or South America beginning in the summer of 1940, you have two options. One is Lisbon and one is Casablanca. Mm -hmm. And getting to Lisbon directly is hard because Spain, though officially neutral, was friendly or friendlier to the Nazis right. and going overland from France over the mountains through Spain right. to Portugal. I'm not going to say nobody did it, but it's, it's a very hard road and not, not something that was considered an optimal route. So basically that ends up putting millions of people into, into Morocco. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, not millions, only tens of thousands. Oh, really? Cause the impression you get is that it's a, a human wave just, shocking numbers of people, but it may have been shocking for the infrastructure of the country at the time. It was, it was, it was definitely shocking for the infrastructure. Uh, so at the time, Casablanca is a city of 350,000 mm-hmm. and 
the the refugees that come following the collapse of France are actually the second wave because before that there's another wave that comes and that that is the the refugees from Gibraltar because once uh, Western Europe begins to fall Britain decides that the civilians that live at Gibraltar at its base um, should be evacuated hmm. and the easiest thing to do at that point is to take him to Casablanca. So there are 13,000 refugees that show up in Casablanca. And that's a lot for a city that size to take yeah. in. And they don't quite know what to do with them. Um, and they, they actually struggle. They, they put them in dance halls. Um, they uh, start using a place called Einstück, which was actually a place that they used to house people during the typhus outbreak uh, for uh, quarantine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they sort of struggle to house these 13,000 refugees. Uh, once uh, France falls, uh, the refugees are expelled um, and they move them out. And just as they move them out, uh, another wave comes in. And it's the refugees coming mm -hmm. from Marseille mm -hmm. and Bordeaux. And so in the summer of June, of, in the summer of 1940, in July 1940, there are 200 ships docked in the harbor of Casablanca trying to offload refugees. And, this, and, and it's not a modern port. Like, like we, we think of a major city having a major port with hundreds of quays and boats coming in. Casablanca is a port, but it's not developed enough for 200 ships to dock. Right. So Casablanca, it is, it's modern for for that time it's modern for africa the french have redone the port and expanded it to uh to facilitate the sort of uh shipping of natural resources from morocco of agricultural products mm -hmm. and also to facilitate the offloading of cruise ships because they wanted to encourage tourism to french morocco mm -hmm. but they are not equipped to offload 200 ships that arrive at one time. Yeah. And that's kind of the situation that they have. And they, they basically there, it, it becomes, starts to become actually a human tragedy because the ships and begin to run out of water and food because they weren't intending to basically sit idle for a month. And so you end up having a rampant sickness uh, dehydration. They offload people. They start to use the large warehouses at the port to house mm -hmm. the refugees, uh, and and then Morocco begins to realize that it has a serious problem on its hands, right. and it doesn't quite know what to do with them. So, on the one hand, you've got the the refugee flow increasing dramatically. Uh, the other side of this, which I find fascinating, is the the American consulate in Casablanca. Right. So the US consulate is is very small. There's just the council and vice council and the support mm -hmm. staff I believe was four clerks and one interpreter um, yeah. at this time in in 1940. Now, that makes sense because before the war there were less than I think fewer than 100 Americans in all of French Morocco. So the the US consulate in Casablanca serving all of French Morocco didn't have quite that much to do. But things changed pretty quickly because as France falls, suddenly the, the British aren't welcome in, you know, Vichy, France. And you've got the American consulate not only representing the Americans who are still there, but also serving as the interest section for the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, uh, mm -hmm. New Zealand, South Africa. And all of these refugees are seeking to get out, many of them to the United States. So you've got visa requests right. that are exponentially expanding. Um, how did the staff handle it? And what were the strains on the U.S. consulate in Casablanca? It was incredibly stressful for the consulate. Uh, as you say, it's a, it's a small staff. They're used to basically helping American businessmen uh, facilitate sales, imports, and exports, uh, Singer sewing machine, Douglas aircraft, uh, export of Moroccan leather. Uh, they are not used to 200 refugees lining up at eight o'clock in the morning every day to 
file visa applications, to check on their application, to plead their case, to get help with getting a residency permit so they can stay in Casablanca. And they are, they're stretched to the limit. Um, then you get added on top of that, like you said, the Americans agree to take over con- the affairs of the common- Britain and the Commonwealth. And they don't really uh, have staff for that. They end up hiring extra staff and they rent office space across the square from the consulate to uh, to provide essentially uh, uh, an office for all the Commonwealth uh, affairs to be handled. Okay. Also during the war, they uh, build a second story onto the consulate for more space. So they build, uh, right. they're building a second story while they're operating on the first floor? Yes. Oof. Yes. That's rough. Yeah, because uh, space, is, space is at a premium and they just decide just to pop up essentially, you know, uh, like you pop up a house, they decided to pop up the consulate. Wow. Uh, yeah. So and that comes later in uh, 41. But essentially in the summer and fall of 1940, the staff is just stretched to the limit. And um, they beg for more help. They can't get any. But I have to really give a shout out to Herbert Gould, who is hmm. uh, the consul general in Casablanca. Because if you are a diplomat and you are in that situation, there are two ways that you can you can react. One is to just be a rule follower and do everything you can to go by the book. Or you can be creative, you can be compassionate, you yeah. can be humane. And he was all of those things. Hmm. Uh, he would write... Uh, letters saying that yes this person this is this person's identity and they're waiting for a uh, a visa to come through so they could go take that down to the prefect and get uh, a residency permit so they could stay and not end up in an internment camp Hmm. Uh, his wife would go around and check on refugees both to check out their story but also to see if they needed any help Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this is really American diplomats uh, acting with true compassion and rising to the occasion. Right. And around the same time, if I recall correctly, um, you had another arrival in Casablanca and it happened to be one of the most famous stars in the world, certainly one of the most famous stars in France. And this is Josephine Baker. How did she find her way from France to Morocco? So Josephine Baker decides to um, that she wants to contribute to the war effort. And as part of that, she agrees to work for the French resistance. And at first, they're a li- and French intelligence, and they're a little skeptical of her. But the thing about Josephine Baker is that she can pretty much open any door and go anywhere. Right. And so she decides to leave Vichy and she originally goes to Algiers where she's going to put on a show, but eventually makes her way to Casablanca with the idea that she can go back and forth between Lisbon and Madrid and elsewhere and to perform. And while she's performing and on these trips, she can also collect information about what's going on. She can chat up, important people Mm -hmm. because everybody Um, wants to talk to her right everybody wants to talk to josephine baker yeah uh and men can be very indiscreet Mm -hmm. around a beautiful woman Mm -hmm. particularly when that woman is josephine baker because they want to impress her right and so she would collect information and then she would bring it back and it would be uh then fed on back to the french resistance and to uh the office of strategic services which was also working, or, well, I should say the precursor to OSS, yeah. uh, uh, which was working in uh, Casablanca as well. Now, this is before the days of modern covert communications and thumb drives and things of that sort. How did, mm-hmm. what were some of the ways that she smuggled this information? Because people knew that information was flowing. People knew that intelligence was, was being moved around throughout this area. Um, how did Josephine Baker get that information around? So uh, some of the methods were she would uh, uh, write information down in invisible ink on the back of sheet music, which of course, as a performer, she would yes. have. 
Uh, she would also um, basically pin things on the inside of her clothing, hmm. uh, basically assuming that you know, she is not going to be uh, body cavity searched or anything like that because she is Josephine Baker and no one would dare to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it also... Um, uh, put things in the linings of jackets. She had a, there were a variety of different ways. Wow. So she ends up in, in Casablanca as well. And you already mentioned the OSS right. in the U S intelligence effort, which had been, I don't know how to describe how small it had been be, before the war started, but it had started right. Um, FDR did send Robert Murphy, uh, a veteran foreign service officer, to North Africa before the United States entered the war, probably before the end of 1940, to to start right. sniffing around. And not long after, in, in, in the middle of 1941, a couple of other officers arrive on the scene. And, and before the war starts, they're already tasked with collecting intelligence in case the United States is going to get into the war and have some involvement in mm-hmm. Morocco. Talk a little bit about their activities and how they played into this this emerging bustling scene in Casablanca. So the the United States basically had no intelligence capabilities or capacity in North Africa at all before the war. If they needed intelligence, they relied on France and Britain for information. Well, with when the war comes, it kind of explodes because France isn't going to give them anything, and most of Britain's. Uh, infrastructure, intelligence infrastructure kind of has to hightail it out. Uh, So there is a deficit of information. And there is this idea that uh, because we're American and we're technically neutral, uh, we have a little more maneuvering room to to put people in French Morocco and Algeria in a way that um, other countries wouldn't be able to. So one of the things that Murphy is able to negotiate is for a relief program to come to French Morocco, whereby the Americans are going to ship uh, food to French Morocco for use by the populace. It's a controversial project because part of what's been going on is that Vichy has been extracting tons of agricultural products from French Morocco Mm -hmm transporting it to Vichy and then sending it on to Nazi Germany. Mm. So there are actual deficits in French Morocco in, in the food supply, but it's because of the extractions and it's because it's being used to support Nazi Germany. But this relief program was also going to be used as a way to station Americans in Algeria and in French Morocco who would be there to quote unquote, observe the shipments and make sure that they, the, foodstuffs from them would be distributed to the populace of French Morocco and not re-exported. These men known as the 12 apostles, because there were 12 of them, uh, basically formed the core of what would become the American intelligence network in French North Africa during World War II. Most of them are from Ivy League colleges. Some of them, all of them speak French. Very few of them have any experience in North Africa. And there's just kind of this boy's own uh, feeling to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But they are smart and they manage to set up a communication network within French Morocco. They uh, form ties with the resistance. Uh, They do things like get a copy of the BAP plan for French North Africa, which is really important if you're going to uh, invade. Mm -hmm. Uh, they also uh, collect information about, you know, movement of ships, uh, dis- distribution of resources. And so you do have a sort of this fledgling intelligence network uh, that is beginning to take hold. And even some of that rudimentary information is exceedingly valuable in the years that follow, because like you mentioned, there was no American information here before. Even right. what are the road networks? What are the railway right. networks? What's the terrain yep. like? Um, what's the what are the population centers near these particular potential landing points? Uh, right. All of that needs to be discovered, and and they use the food program and visiting refugees because uh, you have to travel around to do that. 
They use yeah. that to make side trips and make observations and write things down. Uh, of course, it's not as, I don't want to say it's not as successful because they did collect the information, um, but it's not as, it's not as secretive as, as they think it is because, I mean, the Germans had a presence throughout French Morocco as well. And it didn't take them long, even for the very first person, Robert Murphy, when he when he lands and ends up in Casablanca, it's not long before he comes to the Germans' attention. What happened there? So as soon as uh, Robert Murphy lands in Casablanca, he's on this tour of French Africa. He's going around, sort of doing a meet and greet of all the French officials, introducing himself as Roosevelt's special envoy. Uh, and... He gets a note from Theodore Auer, who is the head of the Gestapo in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. And Auer asks him for a drink at the Hotel Transatlantic. Murphy and Auer had encountered each other in Paris during the 1930s when they were both stationed there. Oh. So Murphy knew exactly who he was. And it was sort of one of those meet and greets where Auer is basically saying, I know your game. And, <laughs> but, uh, it's clear that, you know, everyone is aware of what the Americans are up to and they're willing to tolerate it, which is kind of surprising. Right. Uh, maybe because they didn't think we were going to be very effective or because they didn't really see us as in a position to interfere with their overall plan. Mm -hmm. Very different from Raiders of the Lost Ark, in which we all learn yes. that a German sees an American and has an excuse and they start shooting. So... Very different yes. situation <laughs> here. Uh, let's move forward a little bit because as we get into 1942, the United States has entered the war mm -hmm. and uh, Franklin Roosevelt has decided with, with Winston Churchill that the effort will be against Germany first and primarily before turning the Allies' mm -hmm. attention against Japan. And the big question becomes, with lots of pressure from Stalin in the Soviet Union, the big question becomes, so when are you going to open this, the second front in Europe to relieve the pressure on right. the Soviets? Um, eventually, you know, they, they decide on North Africa. They decide that it's most useful, originally thinking in 1942, you know, um, it's, it's, it's most useful to actually go into North Africa, take it, and then use that as a springboard as a tax into Europe from the South. Now, to do this, you have to prep the area for what essentially is a full invasion, unless you can get the Vichy French to realize that they really should be on the side of the Allies. So talk about that in 1942, because a whole lot of the intrigue in Casablanca was trying to ascertain the true feelings of various people among the French bureaucracy and, and try to figure out if we had to fight them, how would we be most effective at doing so if they actually didn't agree with us? One of the things that American intelligence really worked on, and this is particularly the case with David King, who uh, was in Casablanca, was developing contacts within the French resistance. And part of it was to try and figure out who amongst the French army and Navy would possibly come over to the Allied side. It was less likely with the Navy because they were very pro Vichy. They were very loyal to Admiral Darlan. There was a thought that there was more possibility of peeling off French army officers. And they were lucky in the sense that they were able to convince General Antoine Bethart, who essentially was in charge of the army of French Morocco, to um, join the French resistance, to put his faith in what the Americans are doing. That, and, but they had a problem with him in that while he believed that the invasion was coming, he didn't agree with how they were going to do the invasion. And so <laughs> when the Americans do come ashore, he doesn't believe they're coming ashore because he told them to come ashore at a different point. And 
So it kind of messes up the invasion plan and the, and the plans of seizing the, the house of the resident general, Charles Nogues. And there's actually an argument that breaks out between Beth Art and Nogues about whether the Americans are actually coming. Um, and in the end, the Americans are, and Beth Art ends up arrested. But the ability to sort of peel off high-ranking officials was very difficult because they're incredibly suspicious yeah. of the allies of the resistance, in part because of Charles de Gaulle's ill-fated uh, attempt to take the car. They just didn't think that uh, the French resistance had much to it. They were really thought it was kind of crazy yeah. that the Americans were going to invade French Morocco in November, a period of year in which they actually send troops to the interior because the sea is so rough that they don't think anyone will actually do an amphibious assault. <laughs> so the idea that we were going to come in November uh, just seemed crazy to them. It, yeah. But it made sense strategically. And so they found a way. It made sense strategically. They found a way to make it happen. And so sure enough, here we are. It's November 1942 and Operation Torch, uh, the, the official name Operation for it. Yeah. And suddenly you have the Allied invasion of French North Africa, both in Algeria and in French Morocco with Casablanca as the, the major objective in the latter, at least initially. Um, what's interesting here is the timing of the invasion of Casablanca and the, the eventual takeover of Casablanca, uh, primarily by General Patton, um, and the timing of the movie Casablanca, because the movie... Right. <laughs> had been filmed. Um, it had been filmed starting in early 1942 and it was essentially done, but they had prepped it for a spring 1943 release. And then all of a sudden you have tens of thousands of U S soldiers storming the beach and Casablanca is in headlines across the country. Right. So what does Warner brothers do? Well, Jack Warner had a problem with the movie Casablanca because even though it had a great cast, he still had to figure out how to market the movie mm -hmm. and nobody knew where Casablanca was. And Operation Torch and Allied Invasion solved that problem for him. <laughs> and as you say, Americans open up their newspapers and all of a sudden it's Casablanca. Patton is taking Casablanca and there are maps in the newspapers of French North Africa and Casablanca with like a big circle or a star. So not everybody knows where it is. And they're kind of obsessed uh, with the fact that the Americans are taking Casablanca. So Warner Brothers does the really smart thing and they take the film and they debut it in New York on Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, and as part of this, they actually have the Free French march down Fifth Avenue uh, in front of the theater. And then at the end of the film, they come on stage and they sing the Marseillaise. Wow. And it's a really emotional moment. So it gets them more publicity that way as well. They're still kind of holding onto the film mm -hmm. with the idea of releasing it in early 1943. But now they've got this, you know, they've managed to sort of capitalize on the publicity a bit. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to the the 1943 release and its timing, which gets really interesting <laughs> also. So, you know, the, the long story of the, the invasion, I mean, we'll cut to the chase, TLDR, the Americans get there. Uh, Patton had promised that he would take Casablanca in four days and he does it in just over three days. But suddenly now there's something over 30,000 U.S. soldiers in French Morocco. Um, right. How... How does Casablanca change when it's under, you can call it what you want. You can call it under American right. occupation or you can call it liberated. Um, how does how does Casablanca change at that point? So you not only have these like 33,000 soldiers that show up for Operation Torch, there's another 30,000 that comes in the month after and more, even more after that. And so Casablanca becomes a sea of Americans. They set up tents in all the parks. Uh, they take over the port. Essentially, anywhere there's empty space, there are American tents set up. And American soldiers are essentially, you know, roaming Casablanca and um, trying to help offload all of these uh, 
all of the supply convoys that begin to come through uh, to the port. Because one of the reasons that we wanted Casablanca is because there's a direct railway line between Casablanca and up to Algiers, mm -hmm. which means you don't have to go through the Strait of Gibraltar and you don't have to worry about German uh, subs. Yeah. German, yeah. German subs. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Is Casablanca is not there for its its inherent value, right? It's there because what it can gain for closer to the German presence in Algeria, Tunisia, and and the the attacks on right. on Libya. Um, so yeah, this is what November December nineteen forty two. Tens of thousands mm -hmm. of U.S. soldiers now in Casablanca. Yep. Um, the movie debuts around. Thanksgiving. Just in New York. Yeah. So people are aware of it. It's got some buzz, but nobody's able to see it um, until it will be released more widely in January, except for one person. Um, if you're the president, you have privileges. And FDR, what did he do for his annual holiday party at the end of 1942? Well, for New Year's Eve, he shows Casablanca <laughs> to his gathered friends and family and there are only a handful of them in that room that know that he's about to get on a plane and <laughs> fly across the Atlantic Ocean and go to the Casablanca conference with uh, Winston Churchill. And that just takes it to a new level. Suddenly, the president is in Casablanca for extended meetings with Churchill. And of course, their staffs are there and have extended meetings. And we're talking you know, mid-January 43. And then, of course, the movie sees a wider release starting at the end of January after the president has all these pictures being in Casablanca. You can't plan this kind of publicity. Well, you can't. And there's also the surprise factor because uh, there's a news blackout for the Casablanca conference and the reporter like nobody knows what's going on. They bring a bunch. They don't they've really kept it on lockdown. Um and they bring a bunch of reporters to Casablanca at the end and imagine their surprise when out walks um, uh, Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, Henri Giraud, and Charles de Gaulle. And they had no, it's the first time any, they had any indication that this major uh, diplomatic summit was going on. So then you get not only the newsreels, but the pictures spread across the newspapers again and it just happened to be really great timing for the movie because once again Casablanca is in the news now the the images are coming into America from Casablanca from some of the war reels and other things but still most mm -hmm. people aren't getting an image of what this previously unknown city in in North Africa was mm -hmm. but the movie gives them scenes of Casablanca the odd thing is none of them are from Casablanca the movie was shot <laughs> entirely um at the studio except for i think the airport Burbank. scene was at van nuys Burbank. Uh, airport yeah. but it's not really casablanca and yet it does give the feel <laughs> of of casablanca in a few ways um first of all rick's cafe and secondly some of the architecture that they created at the studio to to recreate some of uh, old mm -hmm. city casablanca um, first let's talk about rick's cafe it's really the the center of the film in so many ways, almost a character in and of itself. And unfortunately, it's not real. So what's the closest thing in Casablanca to Rick's cafe? And and how did how did Rick's actually capture some of reality? Uh, I like to say the closest thing to Rick's cafe in Casablanca was the waiting room at the American consulate, because that's where all the refugees came together. Uh, that's where you, everyone would come and, and they would discuss their ability or inability to leave Casablanca. If you wanted to drink, <laughs> you went to the Hotel Transatlantic. Uh, the bar there played jazz. It was also uh, owned by Allied sympathizers. The Germans drank at the Hotel Excelsior. Uh, and so you sort of had like that sort of dueling, uh, dueling bars in town, as it were. Yeah. The... Um, so is there a bit of a fiction there, not. Meredith, that Rick's, Rick's has Germans, it has uh, apparently free French sympathizers, it has uh, yeah. Vichy French collaborationists, it has uh, overt refugees, that is people like the very right. prominent Laszlo walking through, it has right. others who are covertly trying to 
buy visas out of the country. Um, did did people in Morocco mix like that, or was it more segregated between Europeans, and it was, French Moroccans, and it, others? Uh, it was it was definitely more segregated. But I mean, one of the things about Ricks, if you look in the background, there are Moroccans yeah. in the cafe. That would not have happened. Mm. Uh, Europeans and Moroccans did generally did not mix in public. Mm. Uh, there were essentially the European the, when the French took over uh, Casablanca in 1912, mm-hmm. they built this sort of new European city. It's the white city that is in all the postcards that we see and Art Deco, these really big apartment blocks. And that city was primarily for the Europeans. And Moroccans came into the white city to to work menial jobs and to maybe be shopkeepers. But primarily those public spaces, the cafes, the restaurants were for Europeans. Right. So something like Rick's would have maybe had Moroccan staff as um, in the kitchen or uh, doing menial labor, but not sitting at a table, mm. not at the gambling table, right. not rubbing shoulders like that. One other character in the movie that's, that's interesting, of course, is is Sam, the mm-hmm. piano player, singer, um, apparent band leader. And Sam appears to have met, met Rick in Paris, but it's possible they had mm-hmm. a history before that. I, I was never able to right. piece that together. But by his accent, Sam definitely appears to be American. Um, he doesn't right. have an overly French or African accent. So it's presumed that he is an African-American. Um, were there a lot of African-Americans? in Casablanca before the war? No, the only African-American that I could locate was a, a gentleman named Sam, uh, who <laughs> had been a jockey. And uh, his job was as the night watchman at the U.S. consulate. So you're telling me, you know, even, even though he was a night watchman and a, you know, a hard, hard, mm-hmm. hard on his luck, uh, former jockey, literally the only African-American in Casablanca before the war which is when the movie take took place was named Sam, the same name as yep. the guy in the bar. Yeah. Amazing coincidence. I don't know the yep. filmmakers could have known that. <laughs> I'm sure they, there's no way they could have known that. Right. So let's talk uh, a little bit more. The, the part of the movie that's always bothered me, obviously not upon first seeing it because I was too young to, to know anything about the situation, but mm-hmm. I, I thought the situation in Casablanca and French Morocco was about getting visas was about getting permission to get into these countries and that you couldn't leave Mm -hmm. until you had a visa from the country receiving you. And yet visas are barely mentioned in the movie, if at all. It's all about these mystical letters of transit. (laughs) Now, I understand that there were things called letters of transit, letters signed by French officials that you, Mm -hmm. you could move around the country, presumably without impediment from local police and other authorities. Um, but in this case, there's something odd about them, which is that the letters of transit that, that form the the core of the movie are signed by de Gaulle. Now they've already established in the movie that Peyton is the, the head of Vichy France and his, his big portrait is on the wall and everything in the movie revolves around that fact. What good would a letter signed by Charles de Gaulle have given you in Casablanca before the war? It would be good for getting arrested. <laughs> That's, that that kind of destroys the plot I of mean, the movie. Well, I mean, uh, yes, it does. I mean, you can, yes. I mean, if you, yes. In that sense that it's like, it's, it's definitely, it's a problem with the plot. Um, but if you want to look at it as those letters of transit, which did exist, Robert Murphy had, a free pass Mm -hmm. for all of French Morocco signed by General Wagan. So he could had a person to go anywhere he wanted. Um, But if you, I prefer to look at it as a letters of transit, as a stand in for the difficulty of how hard it is to get out of French Morocco. Mm. Mm. Uh, Because it is, it's not easy. You can get an exit visa. Exit visas are pretty easy to Mm. get because they are happy to see you leave. The problem is that in order to, leave you have to have somewhere to go yeah. and that's the that's that's the real hard part mm-hmm. for a refugee is how do you where do you go where can you go how do you get back 
paperwork. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of prefer to see it more like that about it's it's more about this sort of notion of how do how do refugees get out um for example if you wanted to go to lisbon mm -hmm. you would have to and i'm gonna actually po poke at the movie again about this um there were no midnight flights to lisbon right there were no flights to lisbon uh, what did you fly to tangier in spanish morocco tangier yeah. yeah so you would have taken the train up to Tangier. Oh. And from Tangier, you would have gotten a uh, flight to Lisbon. Okay. So you needed a exit visa for French Morocco, mm -hmm. a transit visa for Spanish Morocco, an entry visa for Portugal, Oof. and then hopefully a visa that would allow you uh, entry somewhere else. And then if you got stuck in Lisbon, you constantly had to renew all of those visas. You had to mm -hmm. renew your residency permit. I seem to recall, it's been a while, but I seem to recall from the movie that Laszlo says something like, don't worry, I have people in Lisbon who have arranged things on this end. So that implies that he's got right. what he needs to arrive in Lisbon. But yeah, yeah, the, the, the movie just takes it for granted that these letters of transit, if you hold them, you write your name on them, and basically you can go anywhere you want, whenever you want. Um, I can jump on this plane at the last minute because I have this letter of transit. Right. Yeah. Doesn't quite work that way, but it makes for a compelling it scene. It does. It makes for a compelling scene and it amps up the drama. And it also um, shows sort of the desperation to leave. And one of the things that the movie does do really well yeah. is there's that opening scene where they stop the refugee and they ask him for his papers and they say that they, they're out of date. And um, he his residency permit has expired and they arrest him. Yeah. That was very common. Mm. Because if you didn't renew your residency permit and you weren't able to show that you could support yourself in Casablanca, you would be considered destitute and you would be sent to one of the internment camps. And refugees wanted to do everything possible to avoid that fate. Right. In part because the internment camps had horrid conditions, um, some more abusive than others, but also because yes. it was it was just hard to get out of them. Even if everything else could be arranged, it would have been hard to to get that first step again. Right. It's hard to do your paperwork if you're 100, 200 miles away from Casablanca, where the American Council it is. Mm -hmm. So the um, the cultural impact of the movie and the, its influence on you know decades of especially American cinema are just huge. Mm -hmm. It can, can hardly be overstated. And there was some recognition at the time. It did win the Academy Award for uh, the director for best picture as well, I, I recall. And then mm -hmm. it was an adapted screenplay. So it won for the best adapted screenplay as, as well. Right. One of the sort of the big motifs in the film is this notion of like the, watching the, the planes leave and take off mm -hmm. and come. And that's how refugees leave. And mm -hmm. refugees didn't leave Casablanca by plane. They left boat. by train yeah. or they, or they left by boat. Yeah. Um, and it would have been better if they had been like watching a ship leave. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I can understand why that doesn't quite work on a Hollywood soundstage. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's certainly not as compelling visually, right? A, a, a boat right. slowly leaving the dock. and, and It's not the same as like a plane coming over through the fog. over Right. And overhead. I mean, and, uh, you know, and Rick's um, Rick's itself would have been in the European section of town, mm -hmm. which meant which was basically fanned out from the port mm. and the airfield Casas airfield was five miles outside of the city as well. Wow. So there's no sitting outside Rick's and watching the planes leave. Mm. So I feel bad. Like, I feel like we need to talk kind of slowly destroying this movie for the listeners, but um, I don't think so. <laughs> I hope you know, that. because the, I, hope I mean, the core, <laughs> the core, message of the movie and the the acting and the movie, all of those elements are the same there there are some historical facts that yeah. wouldn't have quite been right but they don't they don't really diminish the message do they it doesn't and i ha i at least i hope it doesn't i um i mean i know so much about wartime casablanca now and i still love the movie i watched it again last night mm. um before we did this mm. and um, and I just was once again yeah. struck by uh, how well it, how economical it is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also how well it just illuminates these questions of, you know, having to choose what side you're on. Right. And what are you willing to do? Right. And 
for a movie made during the war, that's a pretty powerful message. And I also think it is one of the reasons why the movie has had a very long afterlife because of issues that it brings up, that the choices that the characters make and that, that notion of, you know, what, what side are you on? Absolutely. Well, Meredith, this has been a pleasure to talk with you about Casablanca, its history, of course, uh, in relation to the movie on this anniversary. But we are not going to leave it there because I have in my hands our gimmick chatterbox, and I'm going to pull from it a random question Uh to ask you. Let's see what it offers up today. What book or books are on your nightstand? or for the technologically inclined among us on your Kindle or audible list of books to read. So on my list, I'm, I just started Meg and Kate Nelson's saving Yellowstone, uh, which is about sort of the establishment of Yellowstone as a park and the role of national parks. I've heard amazing things about the book. I, I, her last one, the, the three cornered war, I think it was about the civil war in the U S West was remarkable but the, this one is getting great reviews. Yeah. Uh, I also um, have been making my way through Woody Holton's new history of the American Revolution. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. Which is, is uh, quite good. Don't give us any spoilers made... as to how it works out. <laughs> I hear it works out okay for some people. <laughs> At least for a while. <laughs> for a while. Yeah. So those are the two books on my uh, nightstand right now. Well, that is great. Thanks for letting us know. And again, Thanks for joining us on Chatter. This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a delight. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.